Our next um, keynote is someone who has done more to publicise and provoke people into taking seriously and seriously undertaking cross-disciplinary research into martial arts than anyone else I can think of. His blog, Kung Fu Tea, really has done more than any other project that I know to generate a sense of shared community, a sense that academics are talking to each other, writing for each other in dialogue, and to inculcate and incubate a sense that scholarly research on martial arts straddles different groups and communities. Ben's long and often brilliant essays in Kung Fu Tea have always proceeded as if there were already a shared community of people from all over the world, both on the inside and the outside of universities, all talking to each other in a lively and dynamic fashion. And of course, he turned out to be right. However, what his blog didn't say is that for a long time, to the extent that such a conversation did actually exist in the English language, it only did so really in and through the work of his blog. In the terms of speech act theory, Judkins always proceeds as if his words were only merely constative or constative or descriptive of a state of affairs, when in actual fact they were performative or productive of a new state of affairs in and of themselves. At the very least, Kung Fu Tea has been a key mediating voice, a voice producing the topos and ethos of the conversations that he brought into existence. In truth, for quite a while, Kung Fu Tea felt very much like an oasis in the desert. It was pretty much the only open and welcoming place you could find well-informed essays, reviews of scholarly books and articles, <coughs> discussions of new translations and document finds, analyses of macro-political contexts affecting martial arts, digest and analyses of new stories about martial arts, reviews of films, interviews, guest posts, and signposts to new landmarks and breakthroughs. In all of this, the real landmark and breakthrough was the blog itself or rather the work of its blogger, designer, <coughs> writer, editor, Dr. Benjamin N. Judkins. Ben's commitment to producing frequent, twice-weekly, high-level essays, analyses, and discussions of all kinds of things, too many to number, is truly remarkable. <coughs> At the same time, he's brought us a really landmark book, The Creation of Wing Chun, and he has found the time to work with me to establish and run the journal Martial Arts Studies. As readers of his blog might, will expect, working with him on the journal is a dream, often a delight. Ben is diligent, circumspect, and diplomatic, always diplomatic, sometimes too nice, I sometimes think, but that's probably a good counterbalance for me. Certainly, I thank him for putting up with my deficiencies in these areas and for vastly enriching my working life and the intellectual discussion of martial arts the world over. So here and now, I'm delighted to hand over to him, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Ben Judkins. All right, after that incredible introduction, I'd like you to consider the following photograph. So what do we see here? This is in my personal opinion, one of the more evocative images of the Asian martial arts that I've come across in the last couple of years. In this scene, at the first glance, we see something that looks unremarkable. There are a couple of you know, men practicing judo in an educational establishment's dojo like people in Japan had been doing for decades, you know, and like they still do just now. Yet, while the Asian martial arts often evoke this sense of harmony or, or, or peace, often for entirely false and orientalist reasons, this image is uniquely unsettling. Our eyes are immediately drawn to that rack of rifles that we see behind those gentlemen. And of course, the things hanging underneath the rifles are rows of polished bayonets. And if you are at all familiar with your Japanese military history, you may have seen racks of identical rifles and bayonets like that in the barracks where soldiers you know, slept and eat and trained during their occupation of China. Now, in this case, these rifles and bayonets are meant for you know, a drill team or you know, military education classes. They certainly were not meant to provoke anything on the part of Japanese viewers. 
if you got this postcard in the mail, what you were supposed to notice as a Japanese consumer was, ah, here is a well-stocked modern military or you know modern uh, educational facility. It's the very banality of this scene that sets so many subconscious mechanisms going in our mind. All right? Compulsory military training became an increasingly important part of the Japanese education system during the 1930s, which of course was at much the same time that aggression in China was ramping up. Disciplines like school kendo were reformed to take out the sportive elements and put kids outside on real dirt and try to teach them some practical swordsmanship so when they needed to disembowel someone on a battlefield, they could do it. Um, Jukendo, or bayonet fencing, which has recently been in the news because of China's effulgent protests after, you know, this was, you know, proposals were put in place to reintroduce this into Japanese middle schools and high schools, became increasingly ideological in the 1930s, and in, in the run-up to World War II, it was probably the most commonly practiced, uh, oh yeah, most commonly practiced, yeah, a little too much light. How's this? Is this a good amount of light? Okay. Most commonly practiced uh, Budo that we had. Yet this image, for me, is powerful precisely because none of that is shown. We don't need to see Japanese naval landing forces in Shanghai or soldiers digging pillboxes on some godforsaken island in the Pacific to know what year it is when we look at this. Right? We don't need an elaborate backstory to understand who these young men or are or what their future is going to hold. And no one who looks at an image like this is going to ask whether or not the martial arts are trivial. Because nothing answers that question quite like a row of bayonets in a Japanese judo dojo on the eve of World War II. Do the martial arts, and by extension, martial arts studies matter? Questions of triviality are interesting to me as a social scientist because they have a cyclic quality to them. We're privileged to live in a time when we can actually ask that question in, in an earnest way. In 1941, quite a few people were asking whether or not kendo was an effective means of battlefield swordsmanship training. Uh, people were asking whether it was better to train American soldiers in Western boxing or judo for their self-defense skills. But no one, no one saw the physical, social, or ideological aspects of these systems as being trivial. During the post-World War II period, the American occupation forces in Japan moved to tightly regulate and even ban certain martial practices or associations because they understood that these things created social externalities that reached beyond the lives of individual practitioners. Nor were these observations restricted just to the realm of the Japanese martial arts. Right? Consider this photograph. This is one of my favorites. It was printed as part of an American newspaper article on the Chinese resistance to the Japanese occupation on June 7th of 1939. And here we see a Chinese female militia leader. I actually checked to see whether this was Stephen Chan's mom, and it's not, but it's someone exactly like Stephen Chan's mom. So we have a Chinese female militia leader in Guangdong province. Um, the empty sky behind her highlights the dado. It really draws the eye directly towards the big knife that she's carrying. While American, while American newspaper readers in the 1930s didn't know much about the organization of the Chinese military, one thing that they did recognize was that sword. Even by that point, that sword had gained an iconic status. It was the Chinese counterpart to the Japanese katana. And again, there's a lot that we don't see. The readers can't see where she's looking. We don't know where her gaze is directed. But we don't need to see an artillery-scarred landscape in southern China to know what's about to happen here. A backstory is ultimately unnecessary to understand whether the martial arts were socially significant in China during the 1930s. Indeed, it's fascinating to compare these two images that I have put up, uh, where we have, you know, 
contrasting views of Japanese and Chinese martial artists, both caught up together in the early stages of this same conflict. On the one hand, Japanese consumers of these images were meant to understand how the discipline of Budo was producing an efficient, effective soldier for the state's highly modern military. And of course, it goes without saying that they were willing to sacrifice for home, country, and the bearded crown prince up in the corner, you know, of said photograph. Um, on the other hand, Western audiences who are looking at this, you know, picture in the newspaper, or, you know, pictures like these in the newspapers, they were wondering about, gee, what's the wisdom of sending military aid to China, right? Well, China doesn't do so hot on the front pages of the newspaper, but here they could be reassured that, you know what, the military traditions of this country are going to produce individual heroes and heroines that are going to stand up and they're going to oppose the Japanese no matter the personal cost to themselves. Well, not necessarily a modern and disciplined fighting force like we would you know, recognize, these people are brave. And so they should enjoy our support. More than our support, they should enjoy our military aid dollars. Right? There is a very direct argument that's being made. And it's the simplicity of these images that made that effective. In the introductory editorial of the summer 2017 issue of Martial Arts Studies, which you can now read online, shameless plug, Paul Bowman and I ask whether martial arts studies are trivial. And those images that we were just talking suggest that the answer is not always obvious when we think about this question. We can't really engage in this question without making some scope and domain conditions explicit, right? Who is our intended audience? To whom might these things be trivial? What year are we asking the question? Are we talking about 1939? Are we talking about 2009? By what standard are we going to try to evaluate something like, you know, substance, right? There's a lot that we could say about each one of those conditions, but for the sake of, uh, you know, time and brevity, I'm just going to whittle things down here, right? I've drawn on historical images throughout this, but when I ask, you know, how do we make martial arts studies matter? Are the martial arts trivial? I I'm thinking mostly of the current era. I'm thinking right now, today. Likewise, the audience that we need to be thinking about is not mysterious. I mean, it has its complexities, but we know who we're writing to. In my own writing, I try to imagine myself being read by a committee of three people. As a matter of fact, it's those three people. They're the three people that I imagine right there. The first of those readers could be anybody in this room, right? I want my writing to speak to and to build off of the conversations that are already happening within martial arts studies. And we have got a lot of momentum going, right? As Peter pointed out, we can, we've gotten to the point where we can have an argument, and that's always a great thing. Unfortunately, in my editorial work, I run across scholars writing about the martial arts every single week who don't know that we exist who are not connected to this, right? And so we have to think about, you know, how do we draw those voices into this conversation? The second gentleman on the bench, who I imagine myself writing to, is a martial artist. This person is not a professional academic. Generally, this person has some college education, and they have a style or a practice that they have a burning love for. Right? You know, that, that's their main qualification, is a burning passion. And they want to see their art discussed with the same rigor and seriousness as some of these topics that they learned about in school, and yet they don't want it to become purely an academic object. They, they want to see some aspect of themselves or their practice reflected here, right? And this is valuable because these people are ultimately the sources of data that we need to test and think about our theories, especially when you know, we're writing as sociologists or anthropologists who are concerned with you know, the, the modern period. The final, and in, and in many respects most challenging person you can write for, the guy with the hat on the end there, is a 
fellow academic from one of the disciplines. Uh, looking at his hat, you can just tell he's a political scientist. I am a political scientist, so that, those are the people that I generally imagine myself writing for. Um, and I recently had an opportunity to speak to an entire venue, a little bit larger than this, full of political scientists <laughs> about Kung Fu diplomacy and why martial arts studies matters. And it's an interesting experience always. Uh, it's not necessarily a hostile experience, but you know, none of these people have ever really thought about this before. And what they need to know as readers of my work is that, you know what, this is factually sound and it's theoretically relevant. That this can speak to some question in my discipline. Okay? So I want you to remember those three guys on the bench. Because at this point in time, we're no longer a hobby. At this point in time, our work is going to be encountered, our books or our articles are going to be encountered by each of these three different sorts of readers. And that creates a real challenge when we ask ourselves, how do I make martial arts studies matter? Because simply put, not every reader, not every academic committee, not every funding officer is looking for the same sort of thing. But we have to be very conscious of our audience and, and how they overlap as we go through every stage of the research project. It's really this last aspect of the puzzle as we think about audiences that brings us back to those introductory photographs I showed you and, and even the title of my paper. The horrible truth is it's never been terribly difficult to make martial arts studies matter in a disciplinary sense. Right? People have been doing this for decades. What you do is you locate a critical debate in your chosen discipline, whatever it happens to be. For instance, I as a political scientist may say, huh, how is national identity invented? How does the invention of a shared mythology about the past lead to stronger feelings of national identification today? Right, that's a reasonable political science-y kind of question. And then what I do is I find some aspect of martial practice or martial history or martial representation that speaks to that. These guys seem to be working on an invented past quite hard. Okay, so I'm going to look at them. I'm going to write a couple case studies about them. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to use those to critique some of the most important voices in the literature. I will attack one guy, I will support the other guy, but I will come out with a synthesis in which I have the best of everything. Bada bing, bada boom, right? I have success. Now, actually doing that can be tricky, but knowing what you're supposed to do is not tricky. And that's on purpose, right? Because success within a disciplinary framework is formulaic by design. This is what disciplines do. They make up rules that tell you about when and how you have succeeded, right? And knowing those rules, you know something about how you should be structuring your project as you go into this. And it's all very basic on a certain level, but it's important, right? Because outside of this room, no one is going to take us seriously unless we can first claim that we have made, you know, some kind of fundamental contribution to those discussions that are happening in the disciplines. So that takes care of our guy with the hat on the end of the bench. Still, as I look around this room, this room right here, that's all you, real time, it's clear that when I write for other parts of our audience, things become more complicated. Martial arts studies draws its strength from the fact that we are a resolutely interdisciplinary exercise. We don't all share the same methodological orientation, which is why I can't give you the same paper I just gave all my political science buddies, because it's not going to help you. It's not even going to be interesting to you. Indeed, we come from many fields. We come from all areas of the globe. We write about fighting systems that emerge out of every hemisphere, and I have no interest in challenging that to impose a narrow understanding of what good martial arts studies is going to be. Um, or how we're going to define that in theoretical or methodological terms, because I think that that's almost always a trap at the outset of a project like this. Yet, that leads to a paradox. How do we make martial arts studies matter in the absence of shared disciplinary or methodological perspectives, right? Or even a shared perspective that these things should matter and they should be at the center of our conversation. I think we should turn to the realm of metaphor 
at this point. Metaphors can be very useful analytical tools. It may be helpful to remember that we are not the first group of writers who have ever faced this challenge, right? Lacking an audience with a unified personal perspective, storytellers from time immemorial, and filmmakers, who I'm going to talk about today, long ago discovered that the best way to create understanding was to cultivate a sense of personal involvement and empathy on the part of your audience. If we want to continue to encourage the growth of martial arts studies, we need to do the same thing as we encounter editors and colleagues and those aforementioned funding officers who, well, like you know, my colleagues at the last conference, are not necessarily hostile to what I'm doing here, but they've never heard of this before. They've never thought of this before. How do I create a sense of investment in these guys? To draw on the classic piece of advice originally attributed to that guy, Anton Chekhov, it will never be enough to simply tell these people that martial arts studies is really, really cool, right? That it really matters, that I can do all of this stuff. Rather, we need to write in such a way that we make contributions and we demonstrate that unique perspectives are going to be lost when our voices are not at the table, all right? How then do we show that the martial arts, and by extension, martial arts studies matter? Again, the introductory image of that judo dojo and that female militia leader give you a lot to think about when you're thinking about how do you connect with an, an informed but a non-specialist audience. Or perhaps we want to think about, you know, what Megan Morris was just talking about, some of our favorite martial arts films. What makes for good, effective visual storytelling? Well, authorities on screenplays, and by that I mean Sid Field, has noticed that good stories often share three basic characteristics. First, they have an active protagonist who reveals their character through what they do rather than what they say. Secondly, some aspect of that character's beliefs about themselves or about the rest of the world is going to be challenged, and that's going to provide us with a character arc, right? This is what Wayland means when she talks about the lie that your character believes, right? And heaven only knows we in the martial arts have a couple of those, right? So, so we're all set on number two. Finally, effective writing needs to demonstrate that there is something at stake. The audience has got to feel that the action of the characters have meaningful consequences, both for themselves, but also for other people in society, right? Our image of the judo students and the female militia leaders, while single photographs rather than entire screenplays, drew audiences in and by extension made the argument that the martial arts mattered in the late 1930s because they hit each one of those three points right on the head, right? Our female militia leader here, you can't get more active protagonists than this. I don't know who she's planning on whacking with that thing, but someone is about to be chopped, right? You know, we are right at the pre-chop moment, okay? So we have an evocative image of an active protagonist, right? On the second hand, what is the, the lie that she believes about herself? Well, she believes that whacking that person is going to have some influence on the outcome of World War II, right? That there's something that she can do in the absence of American modern military aid that will matter, right? What are the consequences? Well, for her, the consequences to that belief are going to be quite severe. And for you, the American newspaper read it, reader in 1939, if you don't like cough up and buy those war bonds, the consequences are also going to be quite severe, right? So that's how this communication kind of happens. These same three hints with a bit of translation or maybe transmutation on a more fundamental level, I think can also help us to communicate more effectively when we're discussing our own academic research with non-specialist audiences who are very important to us, who may not even be from our own field, right? And that's increasingly the position that we are finding ourselves in. It's not simply enough for us or half a dozen of our closest colleagues to understand something about why the martial arts matter. You know, we've got to convince the aforementioned, you know, colleagues and tenure committees and editors and acquisition people and all that kind of stuff. Okay. 
And again, these same three principles, protagonists, story arcs, and consequences, are going to help us do it. So let's start with that first idea of an active protagonist. In a screenplay, you generally know who the story is about. If you don't, you might want to hire a new writer, right? You know, because that, that's what makes it a story. Uh, photographs are often the same sort of thing. And luckily for us, academics is a similar pursuit because the sea of knowledge is too big to drink. We're always in a position where we are forced, no matter whether you are a hard scientist, an empiricist, whether you're doing an interpretive work, whether you want to have really thick description, you can't talk about everything. You've always got to narrow your view down to a few key actors, a few key narratives, a few key variables. So we have to be careful how we construct our protagonist. In the social sciences, we sometimes make this distinction between independent variables and dependent variables, right? Where your dependent variable is the thing that's being explained, your independent variable is the thing that explains it, right? And, and then you can set up a simple causal relationship like this. And so if you're going to tell that simple causal social science story, the question now is, all right, well, where are the martial arts going to fit into my particular story, right? Let's think about this. And we do need to think about this because there is an immediate set of traps and potentials that come up, right? Waquant's book, right, uh, Notebooks of an Apprentice Boxer, became the brilliant piece of work that it was because he thought quite carefully about this question before he wrote it. And it was what he thought that was the dis difference between a dissertation that nobody would read and a brilliant book. If we always approach this question from the perspective of the various disciplines, where I start off by saying, hi, my name is Ben Judkins. I am a political scientist who studies martial arts and globalization. Or I am an anthropologist. I am hi a historian who studies X and the martial arts. A certain cognitive bias can enter the process by which we are putting together our models without our even realizing it. After all, in, in my field, we already know the answer to all the big questions. It's politics, right? That's what makes us political scientists, right? Uh, we basically fundamentally believe that politics rules the world. And so if I start off from that thing, what I will discover is that, you know, all of these voluntary groups like, you know, martial arts groups will be co-opted by some larger political process. And, you know, maybe that happens. Or maybe it doesn't. Right? Uh, again, Waquant started off saying, I am going to use boxing as a way of understanding the Chicago ghetto. Right? Boxing will be my lens for looking at serious sociology over here. And that would have guaranteed a book that nobody reads. Um, if we go to that previous example where I was just talking about, you know, nationalism and national identity, you know, maybe we can tell a story where the martial arts come to be supported or tolerated by the state because they provide this unifying mythology that, that services fundamental needs of a, of a nationalist agenda. You know, and that's basically the story that Andrew Morris tells in his examination of the Goshu movement all the way back, you know, that the ruling KMT is running in the 1930s, right? In a project like this, the martial arts as an, exam, as an organization are examined, which is good, but only as an extension of or as a subsystem of some larger, more fundamental project, right? And those can be interesting questions, right? And they can clarify things for us about the martial arts. And Morris made really important under contributions to our understanding of uh, the martial arts, sport, and Chinese society, right? And, and so you got to give him his due right there. Actually, I quite like everything that he did. Yet, as a dependent variable, as the thing that is being explained, what we're doing is we're putting martial artists and martial arts in a very passive role here, right? These are voluntary institutions. These groups face dilemmas. But what we're essentially saying is that their agency is kind of limited. And it's not limited by anything in reality. It's limited by the structure of how we're setting up our models, right? And they be basically become passive functionaries that reflect and, and, and show us different aspects of social pressure. And so, yeah, what Quant as a graduate student was right. Boxing would be a great lens for understanding what's going on in the, you know, Chicago ghetto. 
or Kung Fu would be a great lens for understanding what's going on in China in the 1930s. But the problem is it's only one potential lens among many, right? There are lots of lenses you could use. And after that first or second case study, your editor and then you are going to have to start to ask really serious questions about, well, well, gee, wait a second. Why do I need to keep writing about the martial arts, right? Why don't I start writing about labor movements or the film industry or sports leagues like, you know, the other nine chapters in Morris's book, you know, just for instance, right? Because there are a wide range of other voluntary associations, um, pop culture phenomena, most of which are better understood, better researched, more respected, that would all serve this basic project. Or to, re you know, to return to Sid Field's original metaphor, you know, Passive protagonists in a novel or a screenplay are great because they help us to explore the world, but they tend not to be interesting guides. They don't hold anybody's interest. Now, you knew there had to be lightsabers, right? In the hands of a skilled storyteller, an active protagonist reveals their character to the audience, not through what they say, you know, but through what they do. That's how they're going to reveal their core identities. And, you know, again, we need to remember that this is similar to the life story of a lot of martial artists. People join the martial arts often because they want to change something about their life. They want to change something about their community or nation. There's often a, a proactive impulse here. So, rather than simply accepting the elite view that, you know, of what the modern Asian state should have been circa 1910 or 1920, authors like uh, Hearst, Gainty, and other aspects of Morris, you know, because he's really quite complex, they demonstrated that, you know what, martial artists in China and Japan in the 1920s, these were not passive people, right? These were people that had their own view of what Chinese modernity or Japanese modernity should be like. You know all those martial arts classes that the Japanese start putting in their schools in the 1910s and 20s? They're not there because the Ministry of Education wants them there. They're there because of 10, 20, 30 year, you know, um, campaigns that are being waged by Japanese martial artists and then Chinese martial <laughs> artists to get their preferred vision of society, you know, shoehorned into the educational curriculum. So what we begin to see then is that, you know what, rather than just being a passive lens by which we understand society, these martial arts are actually expressing unique views. When you change the curriculum of all Japanese middle schools, well, well suddenly you're affecting not just people who happen to already be judo practitioners, you're affecting everybody else. Right? You are creating big, important social externalities. And so now, martial arts studies is more than just an adjunct to the pre-existing disciplines. It's a critical tool for understanding a fundamental aspect of the human experience. Of course, in practice, any sufficiently complex research agenda right, is going to have the potential to approach the martial arts as both a dependent and independent variable. You'll notice that I had Morris on both sides of that list. You know, that's for a reason. And that's good. And I think if you're writing a book, you're going to have a mix of this. But when you're looking to make an argument for why martial arts studies matters or why the martial arts matters or why you should pay attention to this, you're going to make the strongest argument, you know, when you show the martial artists as really kind of active protagonists in their own story. All right. So now that we have established this potential, what do we do with it? Well, <laughs> here's Neo. Neo's about to make a very bad choice, if you remember what happens next. Good screenplays encourage the audience to empathize with the protagonist as their actions, in this case his action, reveal something very fundamental about what is going on in that reprobate's head. Right? You don't know much about Neo, but now you know something more when you see how he responds to an authority figure attempting to uh, intimidate him. Right? 
And so this is how, in a screenplay, we begin to establish your story arc, right? We see what you believe about yourself. We see what you believe about the rest of the world. And again, this brings up Waylon's argument that, you know, you're really going to make progress when you find out how that character's false beliefs about himself collide with the larger reality, right? That's the lie that you believe about yourself. And luckily for us in academics, I cannot think of a single area of human life that has more marketing myths, more half-truths, more lies, more legends, you know, more just plain misunderstandings, just colliding constantly than what we see in the martial arts. It's very difficult for anyone to talk about historic European fighting systems without that fleeting image of a just knight charging around the countryside on a white horse flashing into your head. Right? You know, it's been programmed into us since childhood. No matter how much you know that that's not true, you can't tell me that that image isn't still lodged somewhere in your subconscious. I just reviewed Michael Ryan's book on Venezuelan stick fighting, and it was fascinating to me because I didn't know anything about rural Venezuelan culture. But he painted this really evocative image in which there are these martial artists who really believe and hold this notion in their head that there was this ideal world that existed in, a, in the past where, you know, gentlemen, by which they mean small holding farmers who have nothing, you know, could protect themselves from outside oppression with nothing but their sheer machismo, I'm going to clear his text up there, with his machismo and a hardwood stick. And that was all you needed to survive, you know, back in the good old days in Venezuela. And, you know, every Chinese folk martial art practice today must trace its, its origin back to the burning of the Shaolin Temple, because if you don't, they take away your kung fu license, right? You, you literally cannot call yourself kung fu if, you know, a temple was not burned at some point in your past. And this doesn't even begin to exhaust the misunderstandings or lies that seem to define the martial arts. For every internally generated marketing myth that we have, there is also a historically imposed or a socially imposed myth that follows the martial arts. In France and the Netherlands, Various social actors, including multiple successive governments, uh, decided that kickboxing would be a great fit for naturally aggressive uh, Muslim youth, right? Because it would give them an outlet for their natural aggression, because we all know that that's what Muslims are. And not only that, because they would get to do kickboxing with, you know, other parts of the community, it would help them with the assimilation and enculturation process. Uh, Jasmina Rana, in a really excellent paper that I really highly suggest called Producing Healthy Citizens, said, you know what, there are some levels of misconception going on here, just a few. But you know, holding all of that, it's probably not going to help the enculturation process that while you opened a bunch of kickboxing clubs for Muslim youth, you built public swimming pools and started swimming leagues for everybody else. Right? We can't keep track of our myths. They end up working at cross purposes, and her paper showed that really, really nicely. What are some other you know, myths that we have? Well, in America, where I am from, one of the popular myths that every parent believes is that Taekwondo is the, the golden pathway to instilling self-discipline in your child. And apparently, we care more about self-discipline than any other social value that we can come up with, right? And so all children must be shipped off to a Taekwondo school at some point. However, they must also quit. Because if they don't, if they continue into adulthood, <laughs> they become an internet meme. Because we all know that, you know, when you become an adult, you're supposed to quit and you're supposed to do something meaningful with your life, like take up craft brewing or something like that, right? You know, that would be a better use of your time. Now, one would be hard-pressed to find a more detailed examination of the stories that we tell ourselves about the martial arts than Paul Bowman's recently and very highly recommended book, Mythologies of the Martial Arts.
right? After reading this book, it is literally impossible not to see the many ways in which these stories that we have told and that other people tell about us position the martial arts in the modern world and, and shape very fundamental things, not just about these systems, but about ourselves. And as a, you know, amateur historian, you know, social scientist who dabbles in history, I got to say that there is this undeniable thrill that comes with the discovery that some common sense proposition is in fact anything but. You know, figuring that out is great. And in some cases, you want to just jump right out, you know, and debunk that, to pop that bubble. And yeah, sometimes you do. But in all cases, we have to step back and remember that, you know, first we strive to understand the function. What was the purpose? What externalities were being created by that? Sometimes they may be positive, sometimes they may be negative. Or to put it slightly differently, what is the lie that your character believes about their own practice, right? And how does that lie affect people who have never thought of themselves as martial artists? Students and instructors are free to believe anything that they want, and yet those beliefs do not come without implications. Indeed, uh, Doug Weil, in his recent article, which again, shameless plug, also came out yesterday, Fighting Words, demonstrates at length that the implications of the current academic debate on the origins of Tai Chi Chuan going on in China, right, so their academic debate on this, stretch really far beyond the world of a few history buffs in universities, which is who you think would be reading this stuff. In fact, their debate touches on vital questions of both Chinese identity, academic freedom, to what extent can the party control traditional culture, right? And the implications of that debate are important for everyone. Indeed, if you follow the Chinese martial arts and you're wondering why a poorly recorded 10 second challenge match between a low level MMA trainer and that joker, you know, suddenly went viral and why everybody was talking about it, even though most people in China don't care about MMA and there are fewer serious Tai Chi practitioners than you would probably think. Right, so, so actually most people in China aren't you know, really into this stuff. Why did they all get into it anyway? Why did this become absolutely critical to the Chinese government that they needed to step in and squash what was going on here? Well, you know, again, go read uh, Doug Wiles' great article that just came out in, in the recent issue of the journal and it will clear some of that stuff up for you. So, to fully explore the implications of any research project, what we've got to do is we've got to find an appropriate balance between uh, theory and data, right? Both of these things are going to be helpful. Theory is helpful because without theory, we can't identify interesting puzzles, right? Theory tells us when there is something unexpected that we need to delve into. And if we fail to dive into the historical or the social data, we're going to have a very hard time convincing those non-specialist readers uh, that these discourses or that these causal mechanisms have a substantive impact on the broader community. Again, that's the bar that we are striving to reach when we're attempting to show that martial arts studies as an independent interdisciplinary project really matters and really can bring a unique perspective to this table. Which brings us to our final piece of advice. We need to clearly convey to our audience uh, that all of this is going to have meaningful consequences. This is one of the places where I think martial arts studies and the literature has really kind of come up a bit short, right? Um, after all, we've mostly been writing to ourselves, and who wants to preach to the choir? I mean, it seems a little bit unnecessary. We don't need to convince our colleagues in this room that the reconstruction of a Spanish fencing system or the you know, reemergence of Haitian machete fighting matters. Everyone here knows that. Everyone here can come up with six different research projects you know, based on either one of those things before the end of this rapidly ending talk that I'm given right now. So again, we, we don't want to preach to um, the choir, right? 
The non-specialist readers, they don't need this either, right? If you're willing to read another ethnography of Capoeira, I mean, that speaks to a level of obsession that makes apology unnecessary. But when we think about our colleagues in the disciplines, I think there's a lot of low-hanging fruit of potential value that is remaining unplucked. In the opening editorial of the summer 2017 issue, Paul notes that one of the things that we haven't done a great job at so far is talking about actual violence in martial arts studies. And of course, Sixt was here this morning to begin that conversation. And it's a conversation that really needs to be picked up on because in my field, in political science, we would say there's a lot of policy implications for that, right? Which means there's a lot of juicy stuff where that connects to other questions. And these are big questions. These are fundamental questions. And we, as martial artists, should have a natural advantage in seriously thinking about and discussing some of these questions. And we can handle it from a lot of different angles because violence exists on many levels in many modalities. We have domestic violence, interpersonal violence, community violence, interstate violence, right? The nature of martial arts schools themselves means that they have often been implicated in or have been forced to respond to community violence in every area of the globe. Yet, with the exception of a few voices, like, like Sixth, we don't hear a lot about this. Uh, and a lot of the people who have talked about it have been coming out of the historical or anthropological literature, and so they've really been talking about it more in a disciplinary perspective. But, think about those jokers now. What do we, as a field, have to contribute to discussions like this? What can we tell people about the rise of you know, the current rise of organized ethno-nationalist, political, populist sorts of violence that we are seeing. So I, I'm now seeing people needing explanations. So these are the Alt Knights, right, which are a right-wing paramilitary group that have organized themselves in America since Donald Trump have been elected, and they are now going to peaceful demonstrations to beat up commies. Right? And they have like a franchise look and a franchise toolkit, right? And they're not technically martial artists because it's not clear that they get together to train. They just get together to commit acts of violence, right? But I would suspect that if we plumb the depths of our literature and our theoretical insight, we could speak to this. And this is a question that people would be very, very interested in. Of course, I don't want to downplay our accomplishments because they're very important as well. In the last few years, martial arts studies has firmly planted its feet on a new and more difficult path. For decades, we had pioneers like Burton, Drager, and Hearst who attempted to bring the martial arts uh, into the academy, and yet for a variety of reasons, they failed. You know, hoplology never gained the traction that martial arts studies currently enjoys. Uh, and when we look at the few real successes out there, when we look at Hearst's study of the armed martial arts of Japan, or Doug Wilde's work on the Tai Chi classics, yet those works are important. And what they did was they shoved a wedge into the door, but again, they tended to fall very strongly within these disciplinary discussions. The view from 2017, looking back, looks very different. Rather than studies of traditional fighting systems or combat sports being a personal eccentricity, a hobby, something that we do on the side from our quote unquote serious work, the martial arts are now receiving a greater degree of attention. Right? We no longer have to ask whether it is possible to study the martial arts. We just go out and do it. Right? And we do it rather well. The last few years have seen the creation of academic journals, research institutes, networks, book series, an annual conference like the one that, you know, annual conference series, plural, like the ones that we're sitting uh, at here, and lots of publications coming out from top university presses. And my read on the situation is that the appetite for this kind of work is currently increasing. We're still in an upward phase. I know when I go home, I have a stack of manuscripts that I'm supposed to review, and I suspect that you know a couple of you do as well. And that is all great news. But 
a moment's reflection reveals that this rapid success has also raised the stakes of the conversation. A university press can only publish so many monographs a year. So after they've published that first book on the martial arts, well now your acquisitions editor is going to have to sit down in a meeting and argue to her colleagues or his colleagues about why they should publish the second and third martial arts book as opposed to something that's a little bit more traditional that you know they know might you know reach more of an academic um, audience. Graduate students in fields like anthropology, history, cultural studies are focusing more and more of their dissertation research directly on martial arts, right? And every year a number of those students are hitting job markets that are glutted with really good, really well-prepared job candidates. Likewise, that increase in university press publications that we were just talking about means that that first generation of, you know, to use the American terminology, you know, assistant professors or, or junior professors who wrote martial arts studies books are now coming up for tenure review. And this means that you not only have to argue that, yeah, you know what, uh, uh, I can get published writing about this stuff, but you have to argue and you should care about it. You have to argue that, yeah, I can get published doing this and it makes fundamental contributions in our discipline and it makes fundamental contributions that, you know, do new things, right? The question posed by Paul Bowman and myself in the opening editorial in that last issue of the journal was in reality somewhat rhetorical, right? No one in this room believes that the martial arts and martial arts studies are trivial. Trivialities do not inspire 70 people to take up transatlantic, you know, or transpacific airplane flights, right? Yet this same understanding is not necessarily going to be shared by all those funding officers and tenure committee members and acquisition editors out there, right? And ironically, our success in moving beyond that hobbyist phase and kind of really putting ourselves out there on the, you know, uh, on the academic main stage means that we are going to meet these people more frequently than we did in the past. And it may not always be pretty, right? Our next challenge as a field is, I think, twofold. First, we need to establish uh, more of a professional, more of a presence at the various professional meetings that dominate the academic calendar. So that, that's something that I haven't seen yet and that we need to have more of. And Doug Weil, of course, is out there fighting the good, not, I'm sorry, Doug Farr is fighting the good fight and is making that happen in, in Australia this year. Beyond that, we need to find sources of funding to institutionalize the gains that we have made to this, to this point. And these are actually exciting opportunities because they're opportunities to build things that are new. And that doesn't always happen in academics. That is really exciting to be on the ground floor of building something that's new, right? And we're starting from a solid foundation. Yet making martial arts studies matter in the larger context means that the challenges are going to keep ramping up. So again, how are we going to do this? We're going to remember that we need to have an active protagonist. We need to show people that the martial arts are a force in the world. We need to show people, uh, you know, secondly, that they affect things other than just the individual practitioners, right? And lastly, we need to demonstrate that there are meaningful consequences to do all of that. And if we can succeed in that, no one is going to be asking whether martial arts studies is trivial, right? If we do these things, we'll show that martial arts studies matters. All right, that's it. Questions, comments? Hi. Um, Hi. Sorry, I think I was a little bit late, so I, I don't know, may have missed something at the beginning that this question relates to. But um, right, I'm, I, obviously, I do think martial arts studies matter, and I think your sort of conclusions on how to convince, um, like, the academic world that martial arts studies matter, are, you know, pretty good. Everything. 
what I wonder about is like the wider world, you know, like in, um, do you, are you thinking about um, how this works for, you know, say people who just happen to be walking out there in the street or anything like that? Or are you really mostly just thinking of martial arts studies at the moment? Uh, so I did kind of address that at the beginning of the talk. And, <laughs> and the short answer is, um, if it is literally a random person walking down the street, that is beyond my pay grade. That's Bruce Lee's job, right? <laughs> He's the one who's going to make the martial arts matter. But uh, I do think that it is important for, there, there's, what I've discovered in, in my own work is that there's a fairly sizable community of martial artists who take an interest in these questions. So people who are already you know, involved in the martial arts who want to pursue this stuff. And I do think that they're one of the uh, audiences that we write for, maybe not in every single project. But it's important for us to not totally appropriate their practice and to remain engaged with uh, them because, of course, they are ultimately going to be the source of a lot of our puzzles and a lot of our data, you know, and a lot of our insight and a lot of our thick description and all that that's going to make these projects possible. Okay. Anyone else? Um, I, I, I kind of. I wonder um, about, uh, you know, I wonder whether we worry too much about the disciplines, yeah. um, because I think that, you know, th given that this is so multidisciplinary, you can just kind of try different paradigms on for size. I think the political economy paradigm mm -hmm. is, really, is a really great one. It's also the psychoanalytic. Mm -hmm. But I think the question, uh, the, the real, the next question is, uh, if this is a degree subject, what does it look like? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. like we can all go back to our disciplines and our, you know, I kind of work in a journalism department. I, I think they regret that. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> I barely read newspapers, you know. Um, but you know, can it? It's can, okay. I've got that covered. I read the newspapers at okay. least <laughs> once a month and yeah. give you the news. And you share them, yeah. and then my I, I share arrives. them. Yes, yeah. yes. Exactly. Yeah. Can, can we? Um, can can we build? Is martial arts studies a university discipline, a, a field that we could institute programs at an undergraduate level, or is it not? You know, that's the question. Well, I, I definitely think that my answer to that, and I could see what other people in here think, my answer is that we can definitely institutionalize it and offer a lot of things. I don't see any reason why we don't have martial arts studies institutes and research networks and all kinds of things uh, in all kinds of places. Now, whether you can convince, you know, a dean that it is a fantastic degree to offer a major or a minor, I think gets you into the minutia of what goes on in various, you know, universities. And there's literally no accounting for university politics, right? But, you know, can it be institutionalized and can you offer courses? Yeah. Yeah, automatically. I, I think that that is, again, one of these really natural next steps. Can you turn that into a minor? I don't think anyone would have a problem with that, especially if you housed it you know, with the right departments. Can you turn it into a major? Eh. You know, at that point, you're, you're eating someone else's lunch. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Colin. Could you pass this back to... Uh, <laughs> Uh, so I'm wondering what you think about overcoming uh, sort of an academic squeamishness about violence. Going back to six um, keynote earlier, uh, you know it's fundamental to what we're talking about in mm -hmm. martial arts studies. But I think people outside of martial arts studies are pretty resistant to it, and I've. I've certainly encountered that in my own discipline. Maybe musicians are just, yeah. you know, more resistant to it yeah. than other people. But trying to write something and having editors come back in multiple revisions, being like, "Oh, could you, could you tone that down a bit?" Or yeah. that's going to make people uncomfortable. I, it probably varies tremendously by these disciplines so that we're trying to figure out how much we need to worry about. Because so in my discipline, where you know. I'm doing political science, we're, we're pretty okay with murder. You know, it's, it's kind of what we do, right? And so there's not going to be any pushback, you know, if I have, you know, 
discussions of explicit violence in my work. People are going to expect it because, you know, when you're writing an article in the journalism on genocide, you know, sorry, when you're writing an article for the journal on genocide, right, you know, that's, that's kind of, that, that is kind of what they expect. What I'm more worried about, and I actually cut this because I wanted to keep this short, but I'll put it in now. What I'm more worried about is that we become the ones that are squeamish about this. All right, there's another piece of advice that screenwriters give you that I did not pass on because I think it's terrible advice, right? They tell you, write what you know. And that's what so many of us do, right? We, we write what we know. And what is our experience of the martial arts? Well, our experience of the martial arts probably doesn't include a lot of actual community violence where, you know, we round up some group and lock them in the building and then set it on fire. But, you know, when I was doing my research on the Boxer Rebellion for my last chapter, yeah, that's how, they, that's how a lot of people died. That, that, that was it. And so we have to, I think, in martial arts studies, be a little bit okay saying, you know what, I'm going to be more willing to explore the dark side of my own practice, and I'm going to be willing to explore the dark side of my own history, and I am not going to get trapped, and I am just going to write what I know, which is, you know, great Wing Chun in a suburban school where nobody gets locked in a burning building. You know, but then I'm not really telling the story of social violence in China, you know. I, I would like to come back to the question uh, Paul raised and your mm -hmm. response, but I think it connects to what you just said, that um, I've had the experience of building inter-Asia cultural studies over 30 mm -hmm. years. Is what is now actually the biggest network in the world, although most mm -hmm. Anglophones are not aware of it. Um, and one of the things that was absolutely crucial to producing an internationally dispersed critical mass was precisely a methodology of, let's say, community formation, which relied on never writing what you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> forcing, uh, taking the opposite approach to area studies mm -hmm. where you become expert on mm -hmm. a certain area. Uh, our basic organising and, and indeed fighting move in order to create institutional space was to um, invite and, if necessary, force people to address topics that they not only didn't know about, but they didn't care about. Mm -hmm. So uh, not as the primary speaker, but panels mm -hmm. would be formed mm -hmm. where if you knew absolutely nothing mm -hmm. about... Um, rural life in uh, Taiwan in the 1940s, you had to respond for 15 minutes to somebody else's paper on that yeah. on the basis of your own local experience uh, yeah. and interests. So the production of desire mm -hmm. uh, to know about things that you don't know, I think is, is fundamental, first of all, to forming the group, but then when you have this second move, let's say you did want to create a major, the first thing you have to throw away is your beliefs about um, non-disciplinarity or whatever. Mm -hmm. You have to come up with a story mm -hmm. to, first of all, a dean or mm -hmm. funders, but above all, after that, to parents. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you cannot say, yeah, you know, little Mei Ling, her BA in cultural studies, it's not, you know, there's no discipline there. Yeah. Uh, you're dead in yeah. the water straight away. Yeah. So then you have to produce completely different accounts of what um, the mm -hmm. value of this might be. Yeah. And I just think it's the best game in the world. You know, I'm a very yeah. good institutional fighter. Yeah. Uh, and with Meta Yort, we edited a book called Instituting Cultural Studies, which has lots of personal stories about this. Yeah. But the final observation I, I would make there is that if you, are going, if you are going to go in and fight for someone else's lunch, mm -hmm. then you have to know what the moment is in which you're trying to do that. And to fight for studies areas right now is much more sticky and ambiguous than it was 20 years ago. The University of Chicago put out, I think, $5 million US some 10 years ago through the Franco Institute to study the emergence of studies areas and how to have disciplinary fight back against mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. 
You've had a period where studies areas worked as a way of delivering cheap mass education. Mm -hmm. You melt down the humanities faculties. You have like mm -hmm. cultural and media studies instead of 10 separate departments. Mm -hmm. But that's pretty much exhausted, mm -hmm. although it still works in some areas that have clear vocational implications. So then you would think about studies. You know, yeah. is this the way to go? So those sorts of questions. I think of them as a, you know, mercifully now retired chair professor. They're pugilistic questions. Mm -hmm. uh, and you have to think it through like a battle plan straight mm -hmm. away. And it's great. I totally recommend it. Yeah, I, I think that you raise a lot of really interesting points there. I mean, and the first one is this question of how do you build desire, right? And as I thought about my research agenda and as I thought about my blog and the, the journal and the other things that we have done, that's been at the forefront of what we have been thinking about and what we've been trying to do. You know, how do you build a desire on the part of academics that they want to be part of this project? And then, you know, the dark side of that, how do you build a certain set of a certain sense of fear on the part of publishers that they might be left out of it? Mm -hmm. Right? Which is also a very powerful, you know, motivating force. And I you know, I think that the next step is to you know, institutes, you know, rather than degree programs, right? You know, the interdis you know, the interdepartmental institute model, because it doesn't require a huge amount of institutional commitment and funding. But again, it builds that sense of desire in a much larger network, right? And you know, you can offer the classes. Everybody wants the student credit hours. I, I don't know how it works in everyone's teaching system. But in America, you know, you want the student credit hours. So no one's going to say no to more classes being taught or being offered. Uh, and then years down the road, you know, well, we see where we're, we're at when a major comes up. Um, coming back to one of your early slides, I think I'd probably put myself as the second guy on the bench. Okay. So kind of semi-academic, yeah. but more a martial mm -hmm. artist. Um, I think that puts me in the minority in this room. So how do you take the work you're doing and all the lovely people here are doing and start convincing practicing martial artists that, for example, it didn't start with a snake and a crane? <laughs> and is it their job to come and see you or for you to go see them? That's a more difficult question than you think it is. Because I think it starts with a little bit of introspection in terms of, well, wait a second, why are you trying to convince these other martial artists that it didn't start with a snake and a crane? So when, when I do my academic work and when I talk to people, I, one of the things I never do, right, is I, I never go into a random internet forum and just start like bursting bubbles, right? And God knows you could. Right? Anybody can do it. But what exactly is the point of it? Right? Because remember, every one of these myths has externalities that it creates. It has unintended consequences. Some are negative, some are positive. Lots of them are about community building. You tear down a community, what are you going to put in its place? Right? I think what you start by doing when you think about reaching out to a group of like-minded practitioners is you figure out to begin with, are these people like-minded practitioners, really? Are they actually like me? Are they actually interested in this stuff? Are they people who really have a deep interest in history, i.e., they're actually history buffs. They want to know what actually happened. Or are they people who are, you know, they have kind of a surface level interest in history because it allows them to take on a certain identity, right? And I don't think there's any point you know, in arguing with people who are here to take on a certain identity. I mean, that's part of the community creation process. But people who are really actually interested in, you know, what is going on in the world of anthropology? What is going on in the world of history? What is going on in the world of sociology? Then, yeah, those people, please start passing on, you know, links to our articles in the journal and, you know, to the discussions that we're having. And you would be surprised how many of your friends will be really interested in this. And then some of the people you think would be really interested in this, you will discover are, in fact, actually turning to the martial arts for something else entirely. And, you know, it's better to let them have their sandbox. Um, well, on that note, I think we should thank you again. Thank you very much. Thank you.